Good morning, everyone, from Ford City, Pennsylvania. This is Chuck King. On Monday, November 30th, 2020, bringing you Bible study number 259, 259 from Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So now we have Paul uh, moving on on his second missionary journey, and he found this uh, believer, this disciple named Timothy, young man, whose mom was uh, a, a believer, but uh, uh, from the Jewish background, but his father was a Greek, and he had a good reputation as far as his character there where he lived. And Paul, uh, this has always been a mystery to me why Paul had him circumcised, but it says he did it because of the Jews. He, he was, in his mind, becoming all things to all men that he might win some. He shares that with us in another scripture. He would, he would yield as much as he could in order to be winsome or to attract people to the Lord. And here, even though he, he resisted and opposed the idea that uh, people should have to be circumcised anymore after they believe in Jesus, he, did, he had Timothy circumcised anyway. So we see these, these situations where Paul actually continued the Jewish traditions himself, even though he argued against the Gentiles having to follow any of the Old Testament traditions. Verse 4, Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. So they continued to share that letter that came from the leadership in, in the Jerusalem church, which was obviously the headquarters of the entire movement of Christianity. That's where uh, the church began. That's where its leaders were. And they continued to have these relationships with new churches, uh, even among the Gentile nations. And the churches were growing. The disciples were growing. Verse 6, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And, and passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. Now we have these, these early apostles, this apostolic team on their second missionary journey, and they're trying to find the leading of the Holy Spirit where they should go. This is how they depended on the Lord. They waited on the Lord to get a revelation from him, direction from him, where they should minister. And it says here that the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them go to Asia at this time. And then when they went to this other direction in Mycenae and wanted to go into Bithynia, uh, the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them go there either. And so they came down to the seaport uh, city of Troas. And Paul had a vision, verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia 
was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia, Macedonia and help us. So Macedonia was on the European continent across the Mediterranean there. Uh, and, and so they would have had, had to travel to from, from their Middle Eastern area over to, to Europe. And verse 10, when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So relying on the direction of the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit gives, gives Paul a vision at night with a man calling him to come preach to them from Macedonia. Verse 11, so they follow that leading. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Thermothracy, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. So they, they made their way, for, probably took them a number of days to get to Philippi over in Macedonia, and that's where they arrived. Verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we were outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So somehow they knew, whether by uh, locals or revelation of God, that there was a prayer meeting that was held outside along the river there near Philippi. And so that's where they went on the Sabbath. To They, they always look for the Jewish believers or the Jews who were gathering in the synagogues. And here it wasn't a synagogue, but it was a prayer meeting along the river. Verse number 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So we have this this lady, Lydia, who was a God-fearing person, a worshiper of God, so she must not have been Jewish, but she was a God-fearing or a proselyte. It doesn't say she was a proselyte, but she she believed in the God of the Jews, the one true God. And Peter, Paul was speaking there, and the Holy Spirit began to move and opened Lydia's heart to believe what Paul was preaching. So you see, again, the ministry of the Holy Spirit involved in convicting and speaking to people so that they might believe. Verse 15, And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So now we have this, this original teaching of Jesus to his disciples being fulfilled when he told them to go to towns and cities and find a worthy person, that's someone who received their ministry and believed, and stay with them and begin your work with that, that group of people out of that house. And that's exactly what happened here. Lydia believed and, and then offered her house as a meeting place for her family and other disciples who had believed the gospel. Now here it says, we don't get the details, but not only did she believe, but her whole household believed and they were baptized. And uh, I, I assume by the, the apostolic doctrine that they were not only baptized in water, but also baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she basically urged and begged Paul to start a house church in her house. And so that's what they did. Verse 16, it happened that as we were going 
to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. So now they have this servant girl, this slave girl who has a demonic spirit that, that empowers her to predict the future uh, about people or to say things that she should not know, reveal things to people that she should not know, but knows by the demonic spirit revelation. This kind of a, a person was uh, always following, verse 17, following after Paul and us. Luke includes himself there in that team. And she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. So what what this demon spoke through this slave girl was was all true. She was proclaiming that those that team, that apostolic team, were servants of God and who preached salvation. Now, verse 18, she continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. So probably the reason this went on for a number of days is that this demon was speaking the truth. And perhaps it took a while for Paul to discern that it was a demonic spirit and that, that she was being uh, motivated by. And apparently it was annoying to Paul. It says it right here. He was greatly annoyed by what she was doing, perhaps causing trouble for them by crying out, following them around and yelling that same thing about them being servants of God and preaching salvation. So he discerned it was a demon and he cast it out and it came out. So he, he, uh, he spoke to the spirit. This is how he cast it out. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. So that's how he cast out a demon. And it came out. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. So obviously, when the demon left, her ability... To, to be a fortune teller or a diviner left her. It must have been obvious to her owners. And they blamed Paul and Silas and, and dragged them before the authorities. Verse 20, And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. So they, they used this opportunity of them losing their money-making scheme through this servant girl that was telling fortunes or divining things by the power of Satan, and, and they were making money on that. Obviously, people were paying to hear what this girl had to say. And so they they had them taken before the authorities and then accused them of, uh, of causing trouble and preaching, preaching unlawful things that they, they claimed they weren't allowed as Romans to, to accept. Verse 22, the crowd rose up together against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. Now, it doesn't say here, but I wonder if Luke somehow had escaped this. He was there with them, but he must not have been uh, treated the same way. He's, he's recording what happened, but he doesn't say that he was part of this persecution. But they were... They were beaten, and uh, they were with rods. That This is one of the cases where Paul testified he was beaten with rods, some kind of, a, of a, um, a metal rod that they beat them with. 
and many blows and then threw them into jail and gave uh, the, the jailer responsibility to guard them. Verse 24, and, and he having received such command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stock. So he put them in the worst part of the prison and actually shackled them in the stocks. Their their feet were in the, you know what those were. They had their feet through the, the uh, wood and, and were uh, then chained. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. So it must have been Paul and Silas were the ones that were beaten and chained in the prison. And the prisoners were listening to them. So they, in the middle of the night, they began to sing praises, sing hymns to God. And uh, everybody was listening. In verse 26, suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. So the Lord supernaturally through an earthquake and probably through angelic intervention, he uh, loosened the chains of all the prisoners and opened all the doors. Verse 27, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped because they would have killed him. The authorities would have killed him anyway, so he was going to take his own life. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, we are all here. So they hadn't escaped, they were all in the jail. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, when the Holy Spirit moves in such a way, so powerfully through an earthquake and releasing the chains of the prisoners and opening the doors of the prison, this jailer came under the conviction of the Lord and the fear of God, knowing that he, he was lost. And he asked, this is what happens when you're, you're being dealt with by the Holy Spirit. You cry out, what must I do to be saved? There's a desperation. And this is what it, mean, this is what it means to call upon the Lord and be saved. Everyone who calls upon the Lord will be saved. It's not just a flippant uh, little acknowledgement of Jesus, but it's a desperate cry knowing that you are lost and the fear of God comes on you and you realize you're a sinner on your way to hell and you cry out desperately believing that Jesus is your only hope. That's what it means to call upon the Lord and be saved. And this is what he was doing. Verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So the word believe is a faith word. It means to cling to, trust, and to rely on who? On Jesus, which means that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, the only one who can take away your sins and transform you into a new creation in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, people have taken this out of context to mean that if I get saved, it's it's a, a foregone conclusion that my whole family will be saved. Well, my whole family will be saved if they also believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happened in Lydia's house back there along the river. She believed and her whole family believed. And in, in many cultures around the world, especially in those days when the head of the house would believe something, the rest of them would follow and also submit to that that teaching. And the whole family followed this, this jailer to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. So they preached the gospel to them, the whole family, everyone that was there. Verse 33, and he took them that very hour of the night 
and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and his whole household. So there it is again. He, he tended to the wounds of Paul and Silas, and then they baptized them, him and his whole household. And because of the Pentecostal teaching and doctrine, we believe they were baptized in water and in the Holy Spirit. They were, this is the way uh, that they were taught to present the gospel to the people. Repent first, be baptized in water, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Tremendous testimony uh, of the move of God after Paul and Silas were arrested for preaching the gospel, beaten and thrown in the, in the innermost part of the prison and the Holy Spirit. God moved and had an uh, earthquake occur with the chains all fell off and the doors were opened and this this was a move of God for the jailer and his family and they believed the gospel and were saved they repented they were baptized in water and with the Holy Spirit and now verse 35 now when day came the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying release those men and the jailer reported those these words to Paul saying the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. So Paul was not opposed to using his legal rights as a Roman citizen to be treated fairly by the system of government. And here he was treated unfairly as Roman, as Roman citizens, and they were beaten without a trial and thrown into jail. And now you see these, uh, the authorities just, they realized they had done wrong. They just wanted them to leave. They didn't want to deal with them anymore. And Paul insisted that they would come and escort them out. Now the policeman, verse 38, reported these things to the chief magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. You see, you couldn't you couldn't beat a Roman or treat a Roman citizen like this. You had to go through the legal means of trying them first. And and if, if you mistreated them, there were penalties for the for the leaders who I had mistreated a Roman citizen, and that's why they were afraid. Verse 39, they came and appealed to them, and when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. So they, they begged them to leave after mistreating them. Verse 40, the last verse, they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So we have before Paul and Silas and his team left left the city of Philippi, they went back to that house church, that brand new house church, Lydia's house and those of her household and others who had believed, and encouraged them, taught them a bit more before they left. Remember, that was a pattern. You would, you would win souls, establish them in a, a local church fellowship, teach them the basic doctrines, and then you would leave and come back at some point after the Lord had dealt with them to to appoint elders, a team of elders, because you, you wouldn't know right away who these leaders are because they had no fruit that could be discerned, no opportunity to grow in the grace of God and for God to demonstrate his gifting and calling in their lives. So they had to come back. I don't know how long it was before they came back, that it would have been some time, not a very long, long time, but they would come back and revisit. And uh, the goal was to appoint a team of elders who would then take over uh, the oversight and care of that group of disciples in that new local church. And so that's what happened here. So we have Acts 16, 
the the teaching or the study of how the Lord led them, this apostolic team, on their second missionary journey, and they insisted on being led of the Holy Spirit, not just going, but having direction from the Lord. And the Lord actually stopped them from going to a couple of directions or places and directions. And he, he led them to to uh, Troyes, to the sea seashore town, and gave Paul a vision then during the night to go over to Europe, to Macedonia, which is now the area of Greece. And to ultimately, they ended up in Philippi, where they had an opportunity to, uh, to establish a house church in Lydia's house. But along the way, casting out a demon out of the slave girl that was annoying them as they went to the prayer meeting, and they got arrested, thrown in the inner jail, beaten, and how the Lord shook that jail and uh, and uh, caused the jailer and his whole household to believe and to uh, repent of their sins, to be baptized, and to become part of the local church there in that region. So then Paul visited the believers one more time after being sent away by the authorities. And that's the end of chapter 16. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to study the book of Acts chapter 16, to see how you led these brethren by your Holy Spirit, by divine direction, to, to know where to go and who to minister to. And even when they got in trouble and were persecuted, you supernaturally delivered them and won people, drew people to repentance like uh, Lydia and her household, like the jailer and his family, his household. And you continued to grow your church in a brand new area, an uh, unevangelized area by using these men of God and the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. May your name be glorified through us today, Lord. In our churches, we have failed to be these kinds of radical disciples, and our people have a great need for maturity and repentance to grow up to be what you have called us to be in these last days. May we receive your grace and mercy and your peace in these times of trouble to carry out the Father's will for our generation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's another good study today in the book of Acts. We'll go on to Acts 17 tomorrow. This is the end of November. We're ready to start uh, the last month of the year tomorrow, December 1st. May the Lord continue to bless and keep you. Please Spend time in prayer, seeking the Lord in these difficult times. We need to pray for our nation, for God's will to be done, for evil to be exposed, and for righteousness to be exalted in the land and other nations as well. We need to pray for the sick, uh, those who are suffering from COVID virus, and we need to be careful that we don't, those of us who have not been affected, don't get exposed so that we become sick as well. But for all those who are sick, pray in faith and believe God will completely restore them to his divine health and blessing. So please share these teachings when you see them on Facebook so other people have a chance to study the word of God with us. And remember, you can always find me on YouTube at searching Charles John King. And when you see the little photo of my dog Bryn pop up, you click on her and all of my YouTube videos, uh, hundreds of them, will pop up there for you to study what you haven't been able to cover. Uh, we're going to finish the whole New Testament within the next couple of months. God bless and keep you.